My government name is Damaris Elsie Mumbindongo, but I go by the name Mumbindongo most of the time, uh, and most people know me as Kobe. I am 24 years old. I was born in Nairobi, brought up in Mombasa, in a place called uh, Diani, Okonda. So, Kiswahili Changu Kikochonjo. It's very on point. I went to school, Word of Life Christian Academy, till class four. Then I moved now to Nyeri, um, where at that time people imagined it's where, you know, the education was the best. Central province had the best education. So, Kila Mtu Alikuwa Na Peleko Uko. So I went there um, to a school called Brookfield Academy, did my, my class eight there, passed with flying colors. I really wanted to go to Alliance, but I missed Alliance, I think, with like one or two points. I was called to Bishop Gatimo, Gandu Girls High School. I went to school there, I did my KCSE. After high school, um, waiting, well, of course I had the, I think, one month break, um, just to relieve of all things education. And it was just time to have fun, interact with friends. But first thing in January, I think the second week I was back in school. I went to IIT to study computers, technology, as I waited to, to join campus. At the time, I was applying to USIU in Desna. So in May 2010, I joined Desna University, purposely because I wanted to study communications. And at that time, it was known as the best school in communications in East Africa. I pursued communications. Um, with a bias in electronic media, which is journalism, and um, public relations. Since I was a kid, yeah, um, I used to talk a lot. I don't know where that psych went. I had a keen interest in being the first to know everything. So, <laughs> I'll be the first one to open the door. So I think all that translated to who I wanted to become in future. With my family, where I come from, most people are either business-oriented, or doctors, or you know, in those lines. So for me to decide to do journalism, I was out of it. Like no one understood why you want to do journalism. Like, because most people in my family, no, actually no one in my family has done this line of work. Most people are more business oriented. Everyone was like, oh, how would you, you know, how, 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 how will you get a job? You know, how sustainable is it? You, are you gonna be employed for the rest of your life? I mean, who, who do you look up to in terms of this and whatnot? So for me, I think going into school, I went knowing, by the way, here I'm alone. <laughs> I don't even have my folks. I don't have a t you know, someone you know who can assist you to get a job when you're done. And for me, I think that was a very good thing because it set the foundation that I've created to get to where I am today. You know, in school, I used to be very active, particularly, you know, for events, go network with people. By the time I was in second year, I was very well connected. Like if I needed internship, if my friends needed internship, they come to me, hey Kobe, you know, I'm looking for this and this and this. You know, I just make a phone call and wow, people, you know, someone will get a job somewhere. So for me, it was quite, I think, very eye-opening. And I would advise like all young people in universities right now or in school who would like to pursue different careers, just go out and take time and network and know people. Um, Ali, Ali, okay, in my first year, end of, end of first year, I started um, a, a, an initiative for my church. So I used to go to Mavuno Church. Um, with, with a couple of my friends, we started an initiative called 58 Movement, Love Light 58, based on Isaiah 58, which particularly says when you do good in society, don't go parading it. Or when you have um, like a, a pact between you and God, you don't have to go showing people. So if you decide to fast, you don't have to go telling everyone. Well, by the way, you know I'm fasting. You know, you do good deeds, but don't do them for the glory of man, but do it for the glory of God. So we picked that up and decided to start a project called Love Life 58, which particularly dealt with the street families. So we used to go to Nakumat Lifestyle every Friday from 6 p.m. to go and feed street families. So it started something as something small, very small. After a while, we started growing. I think because people in church, first of all, found out about it. So we started growing and it grew and it grew. And it got to a point we used to feed, we, we had fed like 13,000 meals to these street families. We would gather about 200 of them. And this was such, I mean, for me, it was tremendous because we could see lives changing like for real because there are some ladies who okay we're not only feeding them we we're trying to know what the problem was uh, why they became street families and how we would help them to you know to get out of the street so we helped a couple of ladies I, I know like 13 of them I can pinpoint who have you know changed their lives they started selling small things like uh, 
Apo Jamia Mosque, you'd find some of them selling mabuyus and stuff. And basically, it's just from the inspiration and, you know, that the little knowledge you instilled in them that we had at that time of basic things like, you know, getting an ID, you know, how to start to save up, how to start small businesses, how, where you can get small vibaruas so that you can save up and stuff. So for me, that was a great deal. So we had these awards called Spread the Love Awards. And they were happening, I think they were hosted also by Mavuno Church and a couple, I think Nairobi County government and some other people. So we, when we went, we were awarded for being under 21 who were being the most active in society. And that was a big deal. For me at that time, I was in school, I was studying PR. You know, everyone has an ideal place they want to work. So if, I, if I'm doing banking, probably I'd want to work in one of the biggest banks in this country. So it's the same with PR. So if you do PR, you want to work in, or, or journalism, you want to work in some of the biggest um, media houses we have. So coincidentally, the person giving us that award was the owner of one of the biggest PR firms in this country. So her name is Jinedine Kayuki. So I was so excited um, to meet Jinedine. You know, I'm like, you know, once I, I'm in Daystar and I study PR, so I want to sell myself. Yeah, and she was so excited because she was like, you know, even me when I was in school, when I was your age, I used to work at Barclays and I used to do the same thing you guys are doing, trying to, you know, give back to society and see what impact I can have at such a young age. And for me, that was very inspiring. So by the time we were done talking, I had secured an internship position at Jinadin. Couldn't wait to finish that semester just to go and work. So I went to join Jinadin where I got first-hand experience on, on the journalism world, new old, now I made now serious connections, that connections that actually matter. <laughs> after the meeting now, after the award ceremony, the project became bigger and now we used to feed more people and the crowd grew and so many people were interested in knowing like how are you guys targeting, how are you getting through to these people, letting them trust you, you know, because most of these guys don't trust. More people started coming and this became an issue because where we used to do it, eh, it's literally on the road like there's a conjunction between Nakumat lifestyle and there's a another building here which has a hotel so there at the alley is where we used to meet so one time the the manager of the hotel came to complain that we are bringing security when we bring these people here at first we didn't understand why because people like Nakumat were giving us support because they saw the value of what we were doing so we didn't understand why and we had all the permits just to say uh, all the right permits, uh, we had some certification, 58 movement was registered, so we were pretty much abiding by the law. But this um, this guy, as in he was hell-bent on making sure we, we talk at that place. I think it's because, well maybe for him it was making business sense at that time, but for us we didn't understand why he was not supporting. And you know we were young and naive, so I, I didn't understand why he's not supporting what we are doing. This Friday, he gave us a warning. Um, well, we didn't ignore, we, we took it to account. So next time we decided we are going to make it fewer people. Next time when we came, the next Friday, he came back again. He's like, you guys, I told you don't come back here. You don't listen to me. We tried talking to him, he couldn't listen. So he called city council. So they came, started, you know, they threatened to arrest. We were like about six people who were running out the operation for that day threatened to arrest all of us. It's like, you guys are the ones who are you know, displaying Kenya in a bad light. You know, you're sharing uh, these pictures so that you get money. You know, all these offensive things to us. And, you know, for me, I didn't understand. And at that time, I didn't know that you don't talk back to city council. You know, you just, you just let it go. So I told them, I tried to explain to them. You know, they threatened to arrest us. Luckily, at that time, I had met the mayor, the, the, the mayor who was there at that time, about it. So we had told him a bit about what we were doing. So I made a phone call. And yeah, some people were not very happy. <laughs> but for me, my issue was, you know, that pretty much was the last time we did the 58 movement. And for me, the issue was, I, I felt like if I did not know the mayor at that time, me and my friends would have probably slept in jail or would have gotten into something worse. So one day as I was sitting down, I thought, why? Okay, I tried talking first of all to the few journalist friends I had made at that time, but no one saw the value of what we were doing. And, and they didn't think it was a story that was newsworthy. So I felt really bad. So I thought, why not create a platform where you can have young people share what they're doing, show the impact they're making, and you know, share it to the world. Give them that platform which they cannot get on normal media. You can see most of our media houses, um, they focus a lot on politics, 
even if it's a inspiring story it comes once in oh my god in like a month or something but how can we create an environment where because you know media shapes a lot of things like what people see most of the time is what they take in and that's why our country is very political because that's most of what we take in at that time i had met um julie gishuru who is a, a media personality who for me is one of the only ones who tries to you know to share stories in a different light she'll share what needs to be shared what needs to be shared to inspire people i had a sit down with her and shared with her my idea so the worst thing is we had this great idea for this great platform but we didn't know what to call it at first we had started as inspire africa but then we thought inspire africa when you google i'm sure a thousand things will come up i called inspire africa so and yes we are trying to inspire africa but what is going to make our platform unique from all the other people who are who are also trying to do the same thing then i thought someone was talking you know and explaining how africa is a, is, is is such a beautiful continent but it is you know it's like emerged in a lot of corruption racism and what not you can i mean all these vices that we have in this continent and what can we do to help africa emerge from that i grew up in mombasa so my kiswahili so everything for me alternative in akwanga kiswahili i sat down and thought what is the meaning of you know rising from the water for 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 africa like how would we you know equate that process in or, or rather translate that process in kiswahili so and that's how ibu africa came about Basically, Ibua is a Swahili word, which means to emerge, to rise above the water. Each and every one of us has a part to play in helping Africa rise from that pool of corruption and political malfunctions, you know, and mismanagement of funds and whatnot. That's where Ibu Africa came about. So I came, shared the idea, and everyone loved. You know, it's like Ibu Africa. It sounds very authentic, but at the same time. It has meaning to it. So Ibu Africa is a platform that involves a lot of things. It's a platform we created to share inspiring stories of young people doing amazing things in society who are not necessarily known or and don't have the opportunity to get that platform. So they're not the ones who come and look for us. We are the ones who go and look for them and, and, and share whatever stories they're, they're doing. What we started with are Twitter chats. So every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m., we would do online chats with these change makers. So what we do uh, the week before, like during the week, we'd share short videos of them talking about what they've done so far, who they are and why we should join them for the Twitter chats. Growing up in Madare as a young man, we faced a lot of challenges and seeing my brothers and my sisters, the people that I grew up with, uh, getting into crime and trying to have a shortcut in life and being killed by the police at the end of it triggered a lot in me and that is why I decided to venture into having different projects around Madare. I was diagnosed with colon cancer stage 2 early 2010. I had a successful surgery where four inches of my colon was removed. I thereafter went through chemotherapy for a period of eight months. I as a cancer victoress I feel it's my duty and obligation to educate the society at large on cancer prevention. So on Wednesday we'd sit down, guys would ask them questions like how did you start, you know, what, where did you get the money, if it is an, a project, how can I join you and stuff like that. And for me I think that's a great platform because now some of them have been exposed now to more you know, to, to, to larger entities than Ibo Africa. They've shared their stories on international platforms. Some of the people who've interviewed, I mean, we have exposed some, some people who people didn't know about. I'll give you my, one of my best examples is uh, Liz Marami. Liz, Elizabeth is, um, she's 25. She's the first female marine pilot in this country, actually in East Africa. People didn't know about her. People didn't understand even what marine, marine piloting is. You know, people just know about, you know, aircraft piloting. I met Liz through a friend of mine, and, and I thought whatever she was doing was very inspiring. And people need to know that, you know, young ladies like her can, you know, can achieve so much, and so, so can you. So we interviewed Liz, and I'm telling you, that Twitter chat that started trending 
Kenya wide, I think two hours before the chat, everyone was so interested in knowing who is this Liz, why is she, you know, what do you mean marine pie? Why would you want to drive a ship? You know. In an industry where women seafarers only form 2% of the workforce, it is fair enough to call this a male-dominated career. Yes, it's not easy, but having broken barriers to become Kenya's first female marine pilot, I have taken it upon myself to mentor young girls into following their dreams regardless of the gender barriers. Being Kenya's coordinator of women in maritime in Africa, formed in Addis Ababa through Her Excellency Dr. Zuma's initiative to promote women in the maritime career, I have made it my sole purpose to encourage and guide women in the maritime industry and those willing to join it. So by now, I mean, Liz had, you know, has been pretty much on all TV platforms. You know, she's now doing mentorship programs. She's from Mombasa, so she inspires so many young people from there. And I'm so happy to see that, you know, I have people who, who you know, like text me or WhatsApp me and they're like, you know, I've, I, I'm interested in pursuing that course. Where can I do it or how can I go about it? And, you know, and now Liz can help them. So if, each one of them, I direct them to Liz and Liz can help them, you know. Uh, there's another young man, Kelvin Masharia. He's an entrepreneur. I, I keep telling him he's like the next, you know, Manu Chandaria of this country. He's a young entrepreneur. He started something called Sunrise Tracking. Sunrise Tracking basically is about security solutions. So for cars, for CCTVs, you know. So they allow each and every one of us to be safe. And for him, what has made him, you know, cut through the market at such a young age is because he brought in, like he just took something that was there, but he modified it to make it simpler and more affordable. And so many people have, you know, he was in the top 40 under 40 recently you know like it's so exciting for me to see all these people prosper in their own different ways you know through Ibo Africa we've been able to connect this community of you know young people doing small things in their own way but when they are together they do amazing things and for me at the end of the day I think that's how change is going to come to Africa it's not we are not going to sit here and wait for you know the government to do everything for us you know that mentality for Serikali inside here I don't think it will work for each and every one of us. We decided to create solutions to those problems and we're going to show these people, these governments that you know, when they are over there malfunctioning everything and mismanaging funds, we are here trying to solve with the little we have. Imagine if you give us that big th those big things that you guys have. What kind of impact will we have, not only in Kenya, but in Africa? So this year we're planning to do big, even bigger chats, um, plus a TV show. So um, the Twitter chats for this year are going to focus more on Africa. So we're going to have um, guys from Tanzania, Uganda, Nigeria, Ghana, wherever. You know, we have people pretty much from all parts of this continent and they are doing amazing things in their own way, in their societies. And we are hoping to create, you know, imagine if we create small communities like what we've created now in Kenya, in each and every country in Africa. That's gonna be tremendous impact in all these, you know, countries. And it starts just by believing whatever little thing you can do can change the continent. You don't have to have so much money or know all the right people. And I, sometimes I wish I knew this you know, when I was starting out with the other projects, perhaps now would be very far, would have made a difference in so many lives. But you know, sometimes you go through things to learn, because I believe if it was not for, if we didn't have that, you know, altercation, probably Ibo Africa would have never been born. I'm quite happy that I learned from that, and I'm looking forward to changing this continent in the most powerful way, which is through media. First lesson is uh, you need to understand something. As a young person, like I said, you don't need to know all the right people. You know, I hear so many young people saying, um, I can't find a job because I don't know someone. I don't think that's the, I mean, if you believe in your skill, I think you can, and even if you can get a job, create your own job. We have, I mean, people who are doing amazing things in this world just because they decided to start doing something that's gonna make a difference. Two. Not everything you do will be good to everyone. So we might be there, so look at us who are seated there, thinking we are changing the world by helping these trade families. But 
someone else came thinking we are bringing in security. You know. So people don't don't do things to please people. Do them because you believe they're gonna bring an impact and you know you want to be the change that you want to see. Thirdly, people need to understand that we all go through a process in life. So you need to, you know, don't don't rush into things. As young people I know we like rushing into a lot of things. So just understand there's a process and everything you do in life or everything you go through in life is for a reason. Learn to, uh, to learn from your failures. Um, you know, what matters is how you get up, not that you fail, you know. I think for me those are most, most of the lessons I learned. For challenges, well for one, as usual, everyone faces financial challenges. Because you see, even for us, even as a group was, was growing bigger, um, feeding them was the kind of problem. Even with the poor Africa, I mean, I would love to travel the whole of Africa and share all these stories, tremendous stories we have. But for me, it's a good challenge because it inspires me now to work even harder, you know, so that I can fulfill that dream. Second challenge is um, not everyone will believe in your dream. So fine, you're here, you think young people, you know, are doing amazing things. But there's also that other side of young people that we know that are giving all young people a bad name. And you know, funny thing in life, people will always speak the bad and stereotype it as the, the characteristic of everyone, you know. Most people who are successful, most people who have made it in life, it's not because they had a whole team, you know, behind them, you know, cheering on. Actually, the team comes after you've been successful. I'll be very happy if I see someone else pursue the same thing I'm trying to pursue. Um, because I feel there are so many stories to be told that I might not get to all of them, you know, in, 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 in a certain time. What I can advise is this. First, if you have um, a brand name, if you want to build a brand, you need to secure your brand. And not everyone is trustworthy, especially when it comes to business. So the moment they see your brand is growing, they might decide, you know, let me go and register the name Ibo Africa and it becomes my, my brand. So first of all, legally, please take all the required actions. So um, you need to um, register the name. Um, if you want to register a company, even if you don't know how you're going to start, please just register and stay with that name. I believe in one thing and it's guidance. If you know someone who has been where you want to be, please try and seek, um, even if it's just a moment to sit down with them and share your dream because they can see the loopholes before you see them. You know, the funny thing about starting projects is you think you have everything in place. You think you're the one who has all the solutions. But funny enough, you sit with someone, they are going to pinpoint like 20 loopholes <laughs> that you didn't see. So if you have time, it doesn't have to be an expert, just someone perhaps who has gone through you, what, you, what you're trying to go through, or someone who has been or is where you want to go. The next thing to do is create awareness. If you want, you know, to, to, to create value to people. They need to first know what you're doing. Invest a lot in marketing, be it online, be it on the ground. Um, invest a lot in creating relationships with people who can bring value to your brand. Once again, maintain consistency in, in creating awareness. So if you know your chat, let's say like Ibo Africa chat, is every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Next week, don't start the chat at 6.20. And I, I, feel, I feel I need to really emphasize on consistency, especially for young people, because I know we lose focus very fast. I'll sit in for a meeting after 15 seconds, I'm, at 15 minutes, I'm already tired. I need to move on to the next thing. Yet, this whole meeting is of value. So just learn, train yourself on how to be patient, how to be consistent in you know, small things um, as you do. Every young person needs to understand that they are the future of Africa. We are the next generation. After the leaders were there now, we are the ones taking the mantle. So we need to start preparing as soon as possible. Which preparation, you know, preparation opportunity is what leads to success. Take up leadership roles wherever you are. You know, it's in church, if it's in school, if it's in your office, just take them up. Don't wait to be appointed to be a leader so that you start being a leader. You, you start from before. And with that way, when you're given bigger responsibility, you, you'll know how to handle it. Life is not fair, you need to understand that. Um, life is different for everybody. In life you get what you negotiate for. You don't get what you deserve. You might sit here and think because you're helping people in society, people need to know you are a good person <laughs> or something of that sort, you know, or you need to be awarded because you're helping people. 
but in life you get what you negotiate for. Where you are, as a young person, negotiate for the best. Negotiate for a better society, or just negotiate for all the positive things, and that's what you get in life. So don't sit there and think, because uh, these guys are leaders now, and then they're going to leave, that you deserve to be the next leader. No, you have to fight to get to that position. But most of all, you need to be prepared to get to that position.